I, uh, many years ago, I went to the San Diego um, conference. I, I can't remember what year it was. Uh, the one before the re most recent one. And uh, I was really inspired by, by all the lecturers there, so I'm, I'm glad to um, be in cahoots with you here. And uh, I just want to shout out to Jim Malseth, um, who uh, inspired me back then um, in, in my lectures. So um, thanks a lot, Jim. And know that you've affected a lot of students, too. So um, Yeah, so I'm here to talk about propagation. And um, the, basically, the, the, the big picture here is I want to encourage more of you guys to try propagating succulents, one way or the other, OK? Um, there's a lot of really, uh, and there's a lot of really cool plants. And I think by trying to propagate them and grow them, you get a lot more um, uh, feel for the plants that way. And it's, also, it's just really fun to experiment, OK? So um, I really recommend, if you, if you want to get more into propagation, get a copy of this book here, Plant Propagation by uh, Hartman and Kester. And what's really great is that you guys aren't undergraduates. You don't have to buy the most recent copy. So you can buy the more affordable 6th and 7th editions, OK? Um, anyway, it's a really good book. When I started teaching students, I never took a class on propagation. I, I took botany, botany classes. I, um, I, got, I picked up this book, and I read a few of the chapters so I can teach students sort of, uh, you know, basically get more information to teach more to other people. So um, highly recommend that copy of that book there. So um, I'm going to reference our soil that we use in growing plants and propagating some succulents. And I said some because we don't use these for all of them. Um, but anyway, so I, I want you to see what it looks like. Here's our, our um, this is our succulent mix right here. I'll give you the components of that here in a little bit. Another component that we use sometimes is uh, horticultural grade sand, 12 mesh. That's really fairly coarse sand. Okay. Uh, it's in our soil. Should it be in our soil? I wonder about that. But I like the way it gives uh, some of our containers because, you know, succulents can be top heavy. Okay, um, and then so there's our so yeah. Uh, anyway, this will get here in a sec. But this is what I use for some plants. And when I talk about aloe propagation, I'm going to bring this up here. One eighth inch sifted red lava. Okay. Um, well, our soil mix has uh, our UCDO soil mix has three parts uh, five sixteenths red lava. And then what I take when we buy, when I buy this red lava is I sieve it out and I get this for for uh, propagating some succulents like aloes. Um, what you can see is that our, <clears throat> our soil mix is very low in organic matter so that when it breaks down, it's basically, it's the con the, when the organic matter breaks down, there's even more um, inorganic materials there. And so you get a very airy, uh, porous uh, container mix that's really good for succulents, right? Okay, succulents like oxygen. They don't like too much water. Um, I forgot to bring out my... Um, my sticker that Sandy here gave me er, er, last night that says rot happens, okay? All right, and you wanna avoid rot. So anyways, um, especially when you're propagating, we'll get back to that here in a little bit. So um, yeah, all right. So uh, just a little quick thing about growing stuff from seed. And this is really general. We can have discussions afterwards. Anybody out there that dis disagrees with me this? But it's just really general about uh, uh, growing stuff from seed. Is it Mediterranean climate plants you typically want to uh, plant them in the fall. So, and this is what I'm thinking, like South African bulbs, uh, Othana, some of the South African uh, uh, deciduous, summer deciduous succulents. Uh, and then some of the uh, succulents from the Sonoran, Northern Sonoran, they're, they, they're best planted in, in, under these sort of temperature regimes here. Okay, and we'll talk about water here a little bit more. Um, when, when there are succulents that are, that are sort of ones from the more tropical areas, and I say tropical, which I, in quotes because subtropical plants also included, is these plants, when you germinate their seeds, you want them a little bit warmer in the 70 to 80 degree uh, temperature range. And so like this is aloes, we'll talk more about them in a bit, Dorstenias, uh, Wilwichia, I'm gonna show you guys Wilwichia propagation, talk about stapeliids, and then um, other cacti. So, you know, Milo cactus that uh, Marlon talked about yesterday is from Brazil, uh, you know, somewhat tropical, so that one's going to be different than if you're growing, let's say, a barrel cactus, uh, a kind of cactus, or even, anyone ever here tried propagating pedio cactus from seed? All right, a couple of people, great. I'd love to talk to you guys about, about your, your successes and challenges with that later, okay? Um, and then there are plants that are from summer rainfall areas, 
uh, where it's where they really do their stuff in, in summertime. And so like Lithops and Ariocarpus, whenever I plant those seeds, I do them in early spring, okay? And for us in Northern California, early spring is, or is something like April, okay? Uh, April, May is when we'll plant those seeds. So they get it, so their first year, they get an extended summer uh, of growth, okay? So whenever you're germinating stuff from, from seed, you want to make sure that your pots um, are not in full if in direct sun oftentimes because you can bake the soil and dry things and constant moisture is really important for good germination. I'll talk more about that. So in places where it's warm and even in, in my greenhouse where it's warm and sunny, I'll put my, uh, my seedlings somewhere where it's a little bit shadier and there's not so much direct light beaming on the, on the pots um, and, and drying things out on the surface. Okay. Uh, by the way, my style is, is questions as I go along, so if you guys have a few questions, I'll, I'm going to pace myself, etc. Um, but I, I'll take a few questions as we go along if, if necessary, okay? Here's some Othanas. Um, I did, these ones were done last, last winter. There's the date, 11 23 um, These ones, I planted them on the, on, the, on the surface of the soil in the winter time, and I just kept watering it till they germinated. And then once they germinate, then I cut back on the water a little bit, but these were these are now uh, are dormant for the summertime. Okay, so uh, Othana Hare on the right, that really beautiful Othana there. Okay, so again, these are these are winter growers, so I plant these seeds in the fall. And for us in, in Northern California, I have to do it sometime about October uh, or November. If I do it too early, we still have the heat in September uh, to deal with. So, yeah. Okay, this is not the conservatory at UC Davis. Okay, this is the uh, um, Gardens by the Bay in Singapore. Uh, you know, uh, I guess it's part of a big, you know, casino, et cetera, there. Lots of money, uh, the gigantic greenhouses. Anyone want to help me build a new conservatory at UC Davis? I'd love to talk to you about that, okay? <laughs> Ours only have 14-foot ceilings, and so this Dorstenia that like, looks like it's about eight foot tall in here, uh, um, you know, I envy the size of that plant. Okay, and if you guys haven't been to Petra Christ's rare succulents uh, um, in Rainbow, she has one that's approaching this size, a beautiful specimen of it. They came from us. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about propagating this plant here. So here's one of our larger specimens. It's about four feet tall uh, in a container. Needs a bigger pot, obviously. Okay, um, <clears throat> but a lot of people always ask me, um, you know, uh, is when will my Dorstinia uh, flower and when can I pollinate to make seed? Well, good luck because <laughs> I've grown a lot of them and I have only about three plants that uh, um, have sex with each other, okay? Um, and that's about as non-PG as I'll get, okay? Uh, <laughs> all right, so, um, yeah, so it turns out that the plants, the, sometimes, they're, sometimes the plants act like females, sometimes they act like males, sometimes I don't even know if the pollen works on them, okay? Um, so, but here's, a, here's stages of, the, of the, the, uh, uh, the, the blooms, the inflorescences. This is not a single flower, it's many flowers acting like one. Okay, and this right here is the female stage. All right, and this is when you can, you can pollinate it. Look at the pollination stage. So, um, in my plants, when I'm trying to pollinate, this is the stage that I go after to pollinate them. You can see the stigma sticking out right there. Okay, um, and then as the, as the flowers transition, they start making the, the male parts, the stamens, in there. Is it still fertile? I've tried pollinating these from here to here, and I haven't done enough controlled experiments to say this is when it works, this is when it doesn't, okay? It's very challenging when you have limited plants to work with. And then you get to this stage right here, and this is where the plants are dumping out their pollen, and by this time, they're basically, this, these are, are, are male flowers, and the females are no longer receptive. You can't pollinate them anymore. Okay? So, it's kind of fun, huh? <laughs> All right? So, uh, here's that plant again. Okay, and in this, situ uh, this situation here, go back for a second. Oh, I guess it transitions in. Um, what I was trying to do is I was trying to keep track of who daddy was when I was pollinating these. Okay? So that was, you know, dad number one, dad number four, and over here's number two. Okay? And, and you know what I found is that, uh, is that there are some plants that are very female, that they, they're, they're reproductive, like this one right here. This one is, uh, I think this was the UC, what they call a UCLA clone. And uh, this one can, can make seed. 
But there's other ones that, um, that for some reason, the pollen does and doesn't land on this and, and germinate. Uh, or, yeah, um, anyways, germinate and uh, fertilize the ovules in there. And so, honestly, I haven't even figured it out. I, I'd love to try to figure out which plants, what's going on with the plants, but it's kind of a, a plug and pray type thing, okay? Or pollinate and pray, okay? Yeah. So here's the, when the plants are going reproductive, okay? When, you know, we pollinated that, pollinated, excuse me, and now it's making babies, the seeds in here. And these, the way I describe these, uh, these are somewhere between a, 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 a missile launcher and, and really good whiteheads to squeeze out, okay? <laughs> Some people like that thing, right? Uh, anyway, so the, they, when they squeeze them out. It's actually like the, 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 the seeds develop between what are, I think are, what are probably the sepals inside of there, and they squeeze it like you do a watermelon seed. They squeeze the seeds out, and so you, I, you, I use this tule fabric here, uh, this is very good stuff for, uh, for a, um, a horticulturalist, okay, uh, to capture the seeds in there. I make these little mesh baskets and then peel them off and dry the seeds a little bit and then plant them up. Okay? In fact, here's, this is not Thurstinia gigas, this is Thurstinia burnimiana. Um, here's the seed planted, okay, and what I do with, with these and some other succulents is I plant them in the pot, you know, with succulent mix all the way up to the top, put the seeds down, and then put the layer of sand on top, Okay, water them in, and for nearly all succulents, in fact, nearly all plants, constant moisture until they germinate is really important. Okay, and how many of you guys have, have potted some succulents up, and you go there every, you know, every day, some seeds, and you go and water them every day, right? And then you're like, oh, I forgot today. No, the soil dried out. Well, the, this, I call this the Ziploc baggy technique, okay? <laughs> Three inch pot in a, in a quart size Ziploc, water it in, let it drain out, put it in the bag, you see how sweaty it is in there? No watering required. Constant moisture. And all you gotta do is you gotta watch out until they germinate, and I'll talk more about that here in a little bit. Okay? I encourage you guys to try, try propagation. Okay? Again. Here's them germinated. Are you asked if you seal the bag? Uh, yes, yeah, you see, yeah, sorry, yeah, you seal the bag up. Yeah. Close up the bag, yeah, very nice and tight. Sometimes just to make myself feel better, I give them a good shot of carbon dioxide and breathe in and say, Germinate. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> <laughs> All right. So there's the, a pot of seedlings right here. All right. And I'll talk more about this a little bit more, but I like to let them get nice and crowded and as big as possible before I separate them apart from their little, from their siblings, okay? Um, you know, until, until they get old enough that they start fighting, right? <laughs> they don't fight when they're really early, it's a little bit later. Anyways, actually it varies, right? So I think one year I had so much Thurstenia seed that I decided to try uh, doing a little experiment, a visual experiment. 50 seed in the way I described before, seed on the surface, sand on top as a mulch, or inorganic mulch. Uh, right there, and then here's 50 seed that I planted, same thing, without the bag, and I water this every day. Uh, it's obvious which one's better, right? Okay? Um, I don't know if that's, you know, research publishable material there, but <laughs> it's, to me it's a got nice visual of constant moisture versus not. Okay? Do you uh, sterilize the soil? Good question. Thank you for asking. Yes, we do sterilize the soil. Um, we, we take our soil and we pasteurize it uh, for about two and a half hours uh, uh, in, in a big autoclave. But there are recipes for pasteurizing the soil in microwaves. Okay, or if you have an old pot that you don't need too much, moisten the soil, put it in the oven at low temperature. You basically want to keep the soil for about 30, to, 30 minutes to an hour at about 165 Fahrenheit. Okay? So really low setting on the oven for about an hour or two uh, um, to uh, sterilize your soil. It's really important to have the soil be fairly clean of, of other things like mosses and algae, uh, fungi, fungal spores. So I'll talk more about that a little bit later as well. Okay? Any, any other question about that? Uh, so if, you, if you heat your soil, then afterwards do you have to let ammonia Good, yeah, good question. So you heat the soil and then you let it cool down and sit for a while before you then plant into it. So it's good to do that ahead of time, the day before, a few hours ahead of time. 
We have our soil done in big batches and then we store it nice and clean for when we use it. So um, yeah, sometimes the same, we'll use the soil months later to plant up, but it's, we keep it relatively clean. Um, we use um, uh, so a little bit of water with fertilizer in it. So basically whatever fertilizer you, you use, uh, about a quarter strength of it, okay? And for seedlings, they don't need a lot initially. Our soil has a little bit in it. Um, so yeah, it's about a quarter strength. Uh, you know, uh, the, the cleaner, the more pure the water is, the better. Um, but you know, for seedlings, tap water with a little bit of nutrients should, should be fine, okay? You know, that's a, that's a really good question, but I, I, my impression is with, with things that need mycorrhizae is that really it's when they get a little bit older is that when that comes into play. And so the most important thing when you're first planting them is keeping fungi and bacteria from causing to rot, rot to happen. So, um, so having clean soil to, uh, to help seeds get along better is, is, is better than, have, than trying to put some, some mycorrhizae in there. Um, and in fact, when you take seeds like from a cactus, you want to have it to be you want to have it be clean to wash off all the sugars that might be on there, so that the, the so that there's the least amount of food for fungi and bacteria to have a party at your expense. Okay, yeah. So here's some here's some of the, the some of the seedlings of Thurstinia gigas in the uh, in the in the pot there after they germinated, still in the bag. You see droplets of moisture in there. Okay, these ones I can let them go for. A, for a decent while in the high humidity chamber and not lose too many of them, okay? Um, and there, these guys, these plants are leafy succulents. They like water, especially when they're young, and so constant moisture is really important for good growth. In fact, here's my, a couple of my most recent pots of seedlings right here, okay? Ooh, right? <laughs> okay, and you see how big they are? These are, these are already getting on, some of them are about an inch tall. Uh, and they, they were nice. They were, were nice and crowded. And you know, when they're young, you want to keep them crowded as long as possible because most succulents are relatively slow growing compared to other plants. And if you pull them apart when they're too young, you damage roots, and then you really set back the growth rate of the plant. Okay? I'll show you a little experiment with aloes a little bit later that I did. There's my seedlings all potted up separately. You know, uh, separated out. They look kind of consistently the same here, okay? This, uh, uh, this particular batch, it seemed like mama and daddy were pretty good at making all the babies look the same, okay? Like, yeah? When you get to this point, do you ever have to deal with fungus gnats? Ah, good question. It fungus gnats. Oops, sorry, the question was, do I have to deal with fungus gnats? And it turns out that the sand, the mulch sand, uh, is really good at deterring fungus gnats. For some reason, the sand, whether is it the color, is it that it's a little bit drier, the fungus gnats don't seem to be as active when that layer of, of sand is there. So when you, it's one of the benefits for the horticultural sand, there's a little mulch on top of your seeds, is decreasing fungus gnat activity. Yeah, it really does work. We, we have people that grow this thing called a Rabidopsis, a, 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 a lab rat weed, uh, and they use it, when we can convince them to use it, they get a lot less fungus gnat problems. And then you don't have to use fungicides, etc. Okay. By the way, here is a little uh, a diversity of the seedlings when they grow up. Some of those same ones that you saw earlier. And look at the diversity of foliage here. Broad leaves, smaller leaves, bigger leaves over here. This one was actually variegated when it first came out, this Thurstinia. And it went kind of pale. You see how it's much paler than this one? It's not lacking nitrogen. It just turned out to have less chlorophyll. So that one's like, I, uh, I, like, I love that plant. It's my special baby. Okay? <laughs> yeah. Uh, just to show you, just two of the plants, these are some of the same plants in here, larger leaves, smaller leaves. And this is the thing about when you grow stuff from seed, you get to see a little bit of the diversity of what makes a particular species of plant. Okay? And then when you hybridize, you get even more diverse, you, you, know, you get similar diversity or more, but these are, spe this, these are species right here that are crossed with each other. So, yeah, that's, what, that's the beauty of growing th stuff from seed. And then there's just this, okay? <laughs> Isn't that pretty? The little, uh, my former, my predecessor at Davis, uh, Tim Metcalf, called these the bunny ears uh, of, of, of succulent seedlings, okay? Uh, and this is a Caroluma acutangula. Um, and then there's what's going to become succulent in here, 
Okay, for those of you that are, are into plants, this is the hypocotyl that swells up and becomes that, the big swollen part of the plant. Okay, look that up, hypocotyl. Okay, it's a really cool thing in plants. All right, and by the way, this is a relative of, uh, of the um, Caroluma, of the uh, Pumerias. Okay, and here, just to show you someone growing these in really fine mix, really good moisture, okay, with vermiculite, uh, soil with vermiculite in it, and then a misting system to keep it nice and moist, all right? And then here's somebody else using a humidity chamber. Some people like using this. See right here, this is really good fungus gnat habitat. So a little bit of layer of sand in there would really decrease the fungus gnat activity, okay? And then this is really cool, and I bet you there's some succulents you can propagate this way. Plumeria seeds in a little bit of styrofoam floating in the water. That's kind of cool, huh? Okay, and I bet you there's a lot of there's larger seeded succulents that you can do this to. You know, we all remember the avocado with the toothpicks in the side. Okay, yeah, I bet you that you know I wouldn't jab jab in there, but. How about making a little like floaty for the seed, you know? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, that's kind of cool. Okay, let's talk about uh, a plant that sometimes, me, uh, well, that actually likes water and sometimes doesn't have enough to make babies, but because uh, what, what um, uh, one of the previous talk speakers was talking about how um, plants try, always trying to reproduce, we're going to talk about Wawichia and, and it's uh, the way it germinates. So here's, uh, here's a plant called the mother of all witches there in, uh, in Namibia, near Swakopmund that I got to see a few years ago. And for those of you that are young, you know, you may not make a lot of money when you're growing plants, or, you know, working with plants, but every trip you take is a tax-deductible vacation, okay? Yeah, Namibia, you know, it wasn't free, but it was tax, I got a tax deduction, so there you go. Got this, you know, this is a, back in 2008. Here's a, here's a, a, a re relatively sizable plant. This one's a male in here. Just look, look at this one a little bit. That's my like rugged outdoor, you know, explorer photograph. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, you know, thanks to camera angles, this one looks really huge. It's about as big as the previous one, but not as big as the mother of all the witches. Okay. Um, these ones where they grow in Namibia, all right, this is like a forest of them. Look, one, two, three, right in there. This is, it, I, th I jokingly call this a retirement community with no new members, okay? Um, this, these plants, they, they try to reproduce. That's what plants do. That's what all organisms try to do. That's, their, that's sort of what they're made to do, right? Um, and so there, even though there's not enough moisture because this area, excuse me, it only rains every 15 to 20 years, and really never enough for enough constant moisture for the seeds to germinate, okay? But the plants, they keep trying, all right? This is a, ma a female right here, you know, making lots and lots of cones. What, it never rains enough, why, you know, why, why are you doing this? That's what things are programmed to do, okay? Um, you know, people are like, oh, maybe these are the pollinators. No, if you know these little insects with the triangular backs, these are the piercing insects, and they, they're doing their thing to reproduce, and they, at the expense of the Wawichia, they put their little seeds, their little e eggs in here, and then their little, little larvae hatch and eat out the cone of Wawichia, and somebody gets to reproduce, okay? Um, and then there's, here, there's some ants, so maybe ants pollinate Wawichia. They're here visiting the males eating the, the, the pollen right there, okay? Uh, for me, this picture alone was worth the macro lens I bought for this trip. <laughs> Okay, um, you know, there is climbing up there, eating the pollen. Okay, ants make terrible pollinators because they don't fly. Uh, they're hymenopterans, but they, they don't fly, so they're not good pollinators. Um, it turns out, well, witches are the, uh, sorry, flies are the pollinators of well, witches. They go to the males, they eat some pollen, and they're like little babies, right? They're really messy, and they go blah, 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 in there. Okay, <laughs> here I'm trying to do it a little more carefully with a brush. I'm going in there collecting some pollen. And by the way, when you want to pollinate your plants, use natural bristles, like hair. Under emergencies, when I had longer hair, I would cut little pieces of my hair and <laughs> when I ran out of my good, my good uh, cheap brushes here. Okay, so I go in there and rub around, pick up the pollen on these. Um, and uh, anyways, pick up the pollen, okay? 
And then what I do is I, is I dangle, dangle the brush over the top of this and just sprinkle the pollen on so it lands on these little, what are called micropiler drops. Uh, where it, it, this, this stuff is really sweet. If you ever experience, see this on Wawichia, I encourage you to take your finger, touch it, and taste it. And you'll taste the attractant to the flies for the female. Okay? Nice, sweet nectar. Anyway, let's sprinkle the pollen on there. Okay? <laughs> you know, um, it's a give and take. The plants give a little bit of the pollen, or the insects take a little bit of the pollen, but they're messy, so they eventually drop some of it off. Okay. And then here's some, here's the, that's not the same plant, but another one of my plants that, that we pollinated making seeds. There's a seed right in here. Okay, the seeds are winged like, um, like the seeds of uh, maple trees and other things uh, that have wings on them to blow the seeds, for the seeds to blow away. And when I take these and I take these seeds and I pull them off and plant them, I'll show you in a second the, the, the germinating plants, I, ri I tear off this outer wing because that is more food for fungi and bacteria to get started and eat my, eat my seedling. Okay? So, um, yeah, and I usually what I'll do is I'll take these and I'll dry them for a couple of weeks so that they dry on the outside. Again, less moisture there for fungi and bacteria, and then the seed kind of sets on the inside of there. Okay? So, um, we know we've been propagating Wawichi here for many years, and, I, and this last year I had a good amount of seed, so I decided to experiment again, you know? For, for the sake of science. And so here, I planted these in our succulent mix. All right, you can see them germinating in there, the little cotyledons. And then these ones over here are in the sifted quarter inch uh, red lava. Sorry, eighth inch red lava. Eighth inch red lava, okay? So, you know, what's better for the plant? All right? Well, which one looks better to you? There's the soil on the left, and there's the, the sorry, the, the, the red lava on the left. No, no, sorry. Red soil on the left <laughs> and the red lava on the right. The lava, right? Seems to work a lot better. Um, yeah, it's it, the, more oxygen to the roots, to Wawichia. Wawichia suffer from lack of oxygen to the roots uh, in pots, and so a really good draining mix is really important for them. Okay? It turns out when they get older, they can handle water, but that's... And by the way, the ones that are missing there, we've sold off at some of our plant sales with the lectures that I do. Um, so yeah, it's, it's but, but guess which ones are harder to keep alive? The ones on, in the red lava, in the pure red lava, these dry out. Wawichias love moisture. Okay, so I saw that a few of you guys picked some up at the, say, at the plant sales on, on last couple days. Do not, do not let them dry out. Okay, if, if you have to, if you're not sure, if you have cooler temperatures, you're worried about them rotting out on you, a little bit of water, like we, uh, um, uh, Martha was talking about, uh, about the, uh, with the um, uh, lithops, okay? Or, I'm sorry, anyway, Jane, yeah, yeah. So, uh, by the way, here, what's really cool about growing things from seed is you get oddballs sometimes, okay? There's the cotyledons of the Wawichia, there's the two leaves they make, and there's some extra leaves in the middle, okay? I've got about three plants like this that have extra parts on them, okay? It's really cool. I'm waiting for one to grow like a normal plant and stretch out and have multiple leaves and internodes, but one day I can hope, okay? Okay, yeah, it's pretty, pretty cool, huh? I've got a, a, this last year from uh, of the batch, about 50 that I did, I got one variegated one. So I've got a variegated one, but I've got one that's got uh, double, it's a double header. It's got two heads on it, okay? Anyways, and I think, yeah, uh, the, yeah, those four, okay? By the way, when you, grow, when you grow a lot of succulents, you get strange weeds, okay? This is, this is uh, aloe literalis that went into our gutter, so I call it aloe gutter alice, okay? Yeah, I think I'm gonna call it gutter alice from now on, okay? Anyways, so there, there's... Um, a couple years ago, we got this grant to, to grow and prop to propagate and distribute aloes because they're incredibly drought tolerant plants. Um, and, and so, anyways, to grow a bunch, and this is Kevin who's helping me out on the project. He, he got paid with a grant to, to do this. Um, so he's a great, great help, and you'll see him in a little bit more later. And one of the things that I love about working at a university is that we get to teach the next generation and encourage uh, students. And so, uh, he, was one of, he was one of this great group of these, what I call them the like, fantastic group of interns. Um, so here he is pollinating aloe borea. We're, we're going to talk about aloe, aloe propagation now from seed. 
So he's pollinating the aloe. And see the tule cloth over here? This is, he was, he was the, the, the hummingbird for a little while here, and then he covered this up so that the hummingbirds wouldn't compete with him for pollination. Okay? To get pure, pure aloeburii. There's aloe porphyrostachys. We're doing the same thing. Okay? I feel bad keeping the hummingbirds out, but there are plenty of other aloes around for them to feed on. Okay? Yeah, the tule cloth is a really good one for managing pollination. And also capturing seeds for, for certain things. Even for the aloes, it would, capture, it would help capture the seeds. So, um, uh, a couple of years, you know, I used to, uh, I used to plant aloes uh, seed with my limited knowledge of, of aloes and their needs. And I talked to a few of the aloe experts here. And it turns out that the um, aloes, their, uh, their, their, their source of origins are, are, are tropical. And so, almost nearly all species of aloes like good, nice, warm temperatures, 70, 80 degrees. Okay, and so here we were just trying out to see how these uh, open pollinated seed that I collected, see how they would do. Okay, anyone here uh, grow um, uh, aloe polyphylla from seed? Anyone? No? Okay, yeah, I wonder if aloe polyphylla, which comes from cooler elevations, if it might be better with, with cooler temperatures for, for germinating, because I had limited success under my conditions, but I don't grow it because I have, we, we, don't, we can't grow it in the Central Valley very well. So here's the, the aloe seeds planted in pure red lava, because after talking to people, there were this, aloes tend to have problems with fung uh, fungi attacking the seeds. So the seeds are, are, you know, like you see here, on the surface, we just plant them right on the surface. So fill up the pot with the eighth inch red lava, sprinkle the seed on top, water it in, bag it up, okay? And then once they germinate, once I see the little carpet of green, what I do is I start cracking the bag. Uh, what I like to do is I like to put slits in the bag with my nice sharp pruners and put in a few slits in there, and then maybe even crack it open some more and basically wait to go from here once they germinate, all that moisture in there, and just let it slowly over the course of a week or two get to this situation where there's no condensation in there. Now I can pull the pot of seedlings out into the air. Okay? So you never want to take them from here once they germinate and then open it up, rip them out, and put them out into the harsh, dry, harsh world. Okay? Uh, low humidity world. You do it slowly so they can transition in. Hey, Ernesto? Yes, sir? Did you ever do experiments about that? Say it again? Do you ever do experiments about that? Because I always do that. Just take it straight out, and I've never had a problem in 20 years. <laughs> Here's the question that I challenge you, Brian. Did it slow the growth rate down of them or not? Um, you know, the, 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 right, it, you, they, they, they probably can take it. But if you don't, if you do this slowly, will they go through a little, little less shock and, and and have better growth? Okay, I don't know the answer to that, uh, but you know, uh, when do you plant your seed? Uh, I plant from March till October. Okay, yeah. So in the, you do it in the summertime as well. So there should the air should be pretty low humidity, right? Well, okay. San Francisco, there's a lot of uh, fog humidity. There you go. That's it. You're where it's more constant, uh, the, the humidity, the ambient humidity is much higher than mine. We get down to about 20%, and so I have to do this slowly. You're probably up at more like 40 to 50%, right? At least? That, that, that's probably what's going on there. Yeah. That would be my guess, okay? I'm not saying that's what happens, but. Um, so, um, here they, here's a bunch of them right here. We did a little experiment in the bags and out of the bags. And certain times of the year when we have more humidity in the greenhouse, I can get away with doing them straight on the, on the red lava, okay? All right? Um, but what I want to show you, well, I'll show you here in a little bit uh, the details about the soil that we found out. But here's a bunch of different, different uh, ones in here. Aloe melanocantha right here. This, is, this right here is aloe acaris burgensis. Ooh. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and I love I love this one when it's really young, aloe microstigma. Actually, this is where Brian Brian and I have no arguments that aloe microstigma is one of the best aloes out there. Okay. Um, so by the way, these you know the question is is it is it are they ready to transplant? Okay. And the answer for most of these right in here is no. No, they're too young, especially the Caris burgensis. Okay. Too young. You have to let them get nice, big, and crowded. Let them get as big as possible so they, they both the leaf, the above ground parts, the leaves and the stem above ground, and the roots are as, are as sizable as possible so that when you pull them apart, uh, break them apart, you're actually doing very, uh, 
you're not damaging too much of the tissue, okay? Minimal damage on the total um, mass of the plant. Are you writing your labels with a felt pen? Oh, no, no. Uh, <laughs> yeah, these, these, these are, this is not just any pen. This is the Pilot SCAUF45, okay? <laughs> uh, I'll show it to you later which one it is. We only write our labels with, with the Pilot SCAUF45 or pencil, okay? Yes. Yeah. Do not write your labels with a Sharpie. Sharpies suck. <laughs> okay? Sharpies will wash away with regular water and they'll fade. This, this stuff is pretty close to permanent marker. Okay? Yeah. But pencil is even better, honestly. Yeah, pencil. You're a big fan of pencils, aren't you? All right, yeah. All right, you're my friend. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, I, I, did, I recently did a little experiment where I separated out aloes like uh, when they were crowded like, like in this pot here and in this pot and I did them side by side at the exact same time so I'm gonna see what it does to growth rate of the plants, okay? Um, because my belief is that you should wait to, till they're like this and they do let, have less shock. But what I wanna show you here is how we played around with the, the media that we actually grow them, that we actually uh, planted the seed in. So this one over here is in straight succulent, uh, straight succulent mix? Yeah. Yeah, straight succulent mix. Uh, bag soil, yeah, bag soil, yeah, straight succulent mix. This is one eighth inch, one eighth inch, one eighth inch red lava over succulent mix, okay? This one right here is in pure, and also, also the red lava over succulent mix. These two are kind of in between. And then look at the one on the right, the pure red lava. So the thing was, I was convinced to use very inorganic material and the red lava for, for germinating the seed. But obviously this is better right here, right? Okay, but the issue when you have pure soil is that you can have a lot more fungal activity. And so this is, this is what we found the happy medium. Succulent mix with a little bit of layer about an inch, inch to a half an inch of the sifted red lava on the surface. So the seed are sitting on top of that inorganic layer. Once they germinate, they go through and they get into the soil where they do better. Okay. Um, they're very similar in composition, so, um, you know, by the way, you can't, not everybody here can get red lava, right? right? So you find a material that's suitable, a kind of, some kind of inorganic rock that's kind of semi-porous, um, and use that instead, okay? Locally source your, what you, what you want to, um, what you use. What about pumice? Pumice, uh, you know, we used to use pumice. And um, they, it worked really great, but a few years ago we lost our source of, of pumice. And uh, you know, I like to, when this when this gets stuff gets re, that gets recycled into the soil. It doesn't make my soul with all of that white speckly stuff. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but really quick here, it turns out that red lava is about twenty percent less porous than than uh, pumice is. Pumice holds more moisture, so when you have things in pure lava you need to water a little bit more because it's actually a lot drier, okay? So they, they both work, um, and when they're in the bag, it doesn't really matter, um, but we use the red lava now because that's, that's, we have a better source of it. Yeah, it's pretty easy to get pumice in like Washington and Oregon. Yeah, and in Southern California, in volcanic regions, but in, the centra in Central California, it's a little bit harder for us to get it now. Um, so yeah, there's, there, there's places, probably back east, you guys don't get pumice, do you? No, yeah, you have to find something else, okay? So yeah, that was just, just, just to show you the, 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 the differences and, and see what, what we found out is that this was really good for germination, but not so good for growth rate of the plant, okay? And so that's, you know, that's just the, you know, experimenting to find out what sort of maximizes your, all your variables for, for growing your plants, okay? All right. There's just a bunch, of the, a bunch of the seedlings that we planted, a bunch of different species. I love doing this, growing a bunch of the different the related plants together to see the differences even from the baby stages, okay? That's kind of cool, right? Yes. All right, it's fun. So, so try that out, okay? Yeah. Uh, by the way, um, Tim Harvey, uh, who's in, in Thousand Oaks, he can get away with germinating his and growing some of his aloes when they're really young in pure perlite. 
Okay? Um, so, you know, that's pretty amazing. And then here, this is in a, in a chamber that he has a, a cold frame that you can tr control the humidity in there by opening and closing this door, and it's covered and shaded to basically make a big humidity chamber. Okay? So, um, you know, the Ziploc baggies, I, try, I do try to recycle them. Okay? I, uh, so I don't slit, I, I minimize the slitting technique. I usually open the bags up, uh, open the top so I can reuse them. So uh, students can take away used soil and stuff like that. Okay? Okay, a little bit more about pollination and, 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 and seed and stuff. This is not, uh, this is rough pollination right here, okay? Um, Tim Devine up at Chico State, he's taking his male plant and he's rubbing it up against the female, okay? <laughs> I do not recommend this technique at home, okay? Uh, use a brush instead, okay? Uh, <laughs> Well, uh, Euphorbia obesa are typically male or female plants, but every once in a while you get some that are both. Male flowers, actually male inflorescences technically, and then females in here. Okay? Yeah. So, now this one, yeah, selfing. Um, I can just pollinate, it can pollinate itself. Uh, by the way, going back to Dorstenia gigas, one thing that I found out is that you typically, it doesn't seem to work that you can self-pollinate Dorstenia gigas. You need genetically different individuals to pollinate. Okay. Anyways, here um, we the, they made the fruits. I close. I put them in a, in a dry aquarium with a cover on top, so the seeds can bounce around. And there are some seeds right there. Okay. This is very like you know some of them can land in here. And, you know the other land in here, or they land down here. Um, and just by virtue of the amount of area that you have open, most of them are going to land down in here to collect. But uh, this is what um, Isabel. Uh, um, over in near Fullerton, what she does is she made these little uh, cloth from like shade cloth and she made these little, um, uh, I don't know, funnels if you will, where the seeds bounce around there and most of them get caught in this little folded area in here and then she takes them and dumps them out and into um, um, coffee filters to dry them out. Kind of cool, right? Okay. Um, a number of years ago, uh, with Thule cloth, I pollinated, I had two clones of uh, Euphorbia abdul curry. This was back in uh, 08. And look, nine years later, six inch tall seed grown abdul curry. <laughs> That's slow. This plant's slow. Um, I, my adult plants, I'll show you later, uh, I tried watering them a little bit more to get them to grow faster. Big mistake. <laughs> I have to basically make cuttings of mature plants to, keep, to, uh, to replace the root system that I rotted out. Yeah. Uh, another Euphorbia, Euphorbia Jatropha. Okay, there's my, uh, oh, you guys know these little wedding favor baggies? I love these, these are great. Yeah. Okay, it's like, da, 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 da. Okay, anyway, all right. So uh, I want to show you this because a friend of mine did this with, uh, someone was talking about the, you know, Astrophytum asterius, okay? I, I, I want to show you this uh, the, the little technique that he showed me for planting the seeds of this that would probably transfer to other cacti and probably a, a lot of other succulents as well. Um, so clean seed, pull them out of the fruit, nice and clean seed, okay? And back here you can see a little bit of the diversity. We'll see a little, a little about the more, oh, there you go. Look at this. He's trying to get his, make his own super kabuto right here, style, style one. And look at this one, this is so cool. The ones that have less spotting and then the, the winners in here, okay? Yeah, and this is the beauty of growing stuff from seed. Look, right here, are you my brother? Okay? <laughs> <laughs> or sister, are you my sister? Okay? So here's what my friend Barry Rice does for growing uh, um, his, his astrophytums and other cactus seeds. He t this, is, this is not pure red lava, this is actually the succulent mix, okay? He, he sprinkles the seeds on the top of the succulent mix, covers it with sand, and then waters it with the hydrogen peroxide. This is straight, this is 3% hydrogen peroxide, okay? It's not really super concentrated stuff. So he waters it in and, and just soaks it, and basically what the hydrogen peroxide does, it probably destroys a lot of algal spores, fungal spores, um, other spores, you know, uh, uh, yeah, fungi, algae, and probably mosses as well and then basically sterilizes the soil, and then he puts them in baggies, okay? So there are his baggies back in here, okay? He does them in the little rose pots, the smaller pots, because he doesn't have to do big batches like I do, 
Um, and then he does the same thing with the uh, um, you know, baggy technique and opening them up, etc. Okay? And now, so I want to show you this here. This is 23 days after germination using the, um, the um, hydrogen peroxide. By the way, you see how the soil sunk down from the original height? The hydrogen peroxide ate up the organic matter and broke it down. And it sunk, sunk down in there. Because that's what hydrogen peroxide does. Okay? And there's uh, 75 days later. Okay? And then six months later. Okay? And so he says that he debags them uh, about four to six months later when some of the following will occur. But I just want to show you this. He says um, now that he's using the, the, the hydrogen peroxide, when he waters them in, a lot less algal problems. Okay? So, so it does certain. hydrogen peroxide watering or more than once? Well, just once. Just the initial one. But then he's got them in the baggies, so he doesn't need any more water after that. Okay? So, yeah, maybe you could do that with your cycad seed. <laughs> All right. Anyways, this is what he says. He basically keeps them bagged until he sees the algae starts growing, you know, thickly and over the plants. Uh, they're about eight to ten millimeters in diameter, or when he's out of room. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So when basically he needs room for his next batch of seedlings. Um, but yeah, that's a you know pretty good amount of time uh, in 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 the baggies without any extra water. Okay. I don't know, maybe, down, maybe four months later he goes in and adds a little, dribbles a little bit more water, but uh, pretty much not. So there's, there it is again all, all together. Okay? Uh, and what Barry was telling me, he's talked to some people, there are some people that use fungicides on a very regular basis, okay, or maybe better sterilization techniques like our soil at UC Davis, and they keep them bagged for up to a year. But I myself, I don't like to use this stuff on a regular basis, okay? Uh, in fact, I never plant seed with fungicides. Maybe here and there I should, but I don't like to use a lot of chemicals. Um, and so that hydrogen peroxide is a good, a good happy medium. Ernesto? Yes. Mauro Peixoto down in Brazil uses chamomile tea. Oh. When he plants. Okay, so it's got, it has some kind of antifungal properties to it probably? Yeah. Yeah, yeah probably there's a, 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 a lot of other plant materials that you could use to do that same sort of thing, yeah. Yeah, apparently Creo, so those of you that are in the Sonoran Desert, Creosote is supposed to have some uh, antifungal capabilities, so maybe you can make a tea from that. Uh, but don't drink it uh, out before you do some research on that, okay? All right. <laughs> uh, by the way, letting the seedlings get crowded, okay? Ooh, I better speed it up here. Um, letting the seedlings get crowded is pretty important, okay? These ones got a little bit too crowded. All right, let's get on to some, uh, yeah, some tissue culture here uh, to finish up in the last five minutes. Okay, so we were trying to do some tissue culture with aloes and we were using aloe flower stalks. What basically we found out is that let Tim Harvey do the tissue culture. He's better experienced than we are. Okay, here's his lab right here. We tried it, we just didn't do it long enough within a grant cycle to get really good at it. Okay, uh, even Tim, when he first started out, had to play around with the techniques to get better and better at it. Okay, so those of you that buy his plants, you know, he puts a lot of energy into making those plants happen. So, um, yeah. A little public service announcement, okay? Uh, alamite, someone mentioned it, brought it up before. Uh, watch out for this on your aloes, all right? Um, if the best method of, of getting rid of it is removal, physical removal, okay? And I, I just brought this in because uh, sometimes this is like material for tissue culture. If you kill off the, kill off the mites, then you can use this for tissue culturing because it's proliferation tissue. Um, anyways, for killing off the alamite, uh, if you want to use a pesticide, a uh, miticide called Contos works really well. Okay, there's the mite. There it is, the LA Arboretum attacking many, many aloes. Okay, watch out for it. It also jumps on your relatives, like Gasterias and Haworthias. Okay. What might dinner get in there? Oh, what? Okay. Okay, I'm going to jump ahead and uh, to finish up in the last five minutes here real quick. So I want to show you this, this uh, vegetative propagation technique with aloes and quartering. Some people carve them out. I like to quarter them, okay? Um, March 2001, uh, a, couple, a couple months later, uh, we tried using cytokinin to get it to proliferate more. Very bad idea. Allopalanza is very slow growing. When you add extra hormone, it's a fail, okay? Um, see this one over here? This one here that has four heads, each one survived. 
This one, the ones that I treated with cytokine and didn't grow, and I lost the other, the other two here. Um, I want to show you, that, so, and by the way, the, when you're doing, when you're uh, quartering them, use a nice sharp knife, stainless steel, sterilized, not an unsterilized serrated knife. Rot. Okay? Yeah. There's the plant uh, when it grew up. Just, I just took very good, go back recently. And look at this, I split this one again, so I'm making a shrubby allopalanzii. Okay? Yeah. So the quartering technique. You can quarter them because this meristem is made up of many cells, and if you split that and then keep it apart, then you, each one will grow individually. Okay? I want to get to, uh, to uh, tissue culture, real, uh, to um, grafting real quick. So um, we were doing this with uh, a couple of aloes like Paris Bergensis and Burii. I used the late greenhouse labels to split them apart and keep them apart from each other. Okay? This one just happened by an accident. Uh, rainfall damaged the growing meristem, knocked it off, it didn't rot out on me, and now this, this guy is making babies. So, sometimes nature will make more plants for you. Look at this one, you guys know this one, right? Ooh. Okay, I finally decided to try this. Stainless steel knife. Okay, and each one of these should grow and then proliferate and make more babies for us. So, uh, try this or don't try this at home. Okay? All right? Um, because to me, this is, this is a little bit more controlled. You do less damage. It's like, it's like, um, well, anyways, it's like a, a surgery versus, versus, I don't know, a puncture. Yeah. Stuff, yes? On the plantsies, you split them, but you didn't separate them like you did the uh, abrasion injury. Is that, you just, what do you use to hold them apart? Uh, the greenhouse labels. I just wedged greenhouse labels in between them. Yeah. Um, because the, uh, the aloes, I wanted to keep them on the plant. And so I just, I just split the marist and left it attached. Yeah. Uh, but, but Rob Roy down in uh, Fullerton told me that you, got, you can go through the whole plant here and it'll be fine. So I took his word on it. Cacti, same sort of thing. Split the marist and now I have two branches instead of one. Okay. And with the cacti, you have to cut the tops of them off and then splay them apart. If you leave the tips on them, they'll grow back into themselves in the middle. So you have to chop the top off and then get it to branch. Um, blah, blah, blah. Let's get to grafting real quick. Hormones. <laughs> By the way, if you ever use hormones on succulents, sorry, uh, use really low concentration. Succulents are very sensitive to hormones. They just need a little bit to direct them, okay? See, um, uh, well, I'm just going to jump ahead. I want to get to the to tissue culturing real quick. Um, Thorstenia gigas, propagated via aeroponic propagation. Look at that. Beautiful root system on there, okay? Um, yeah, I'm going to jump ahead. There's my aloe um, apple curry, uh, euphorbia apple curry cutting. There's the plant that I have to reroot. Bad earnest. Okay. See this right here when you make cuttings of, of, um, of cacti? You don't want to plant them right away with this. Keep them upright so that the hormones work really well and, and, and travel down to the bottom. Wait till the, the wound heals like this where it's really leathery. And then there's roots there. Now it's time to plant it in some lava rock. Okay? I don't plant them into soil right away. Okay, let's go ahead and jump ahead to that lovely plant that people want. To grafting, okay? Ooh. Yeah, Stechium hintonii. Okay, I'm just going to do the grafting and then we'll, I'll stop. So, um, we grafted this, these guys right here to speed, them, to speed them up. And look how quickly, from germination to grafting two months later to the plant flowering um, within one year. Okay, that's the beauty of grafting. So just let me show you the techniques real quick. When you do this, when you graft cacti, you, wanna, you, want, you, you can use rough instruments like a nice sharp pruner to cut the top off of this one, cut the bottom off of this guy right here, and then set it on t uh, and then clean it up with a really nice razor blade, really nice sharp razor blade that's sterile. You can reuse it or sterilize it or get a new one. And then you set them on top, line up the vascular tissue, Stick them together with like a rubber band, okay? And there it is, you have, to, you have to play around with the rubber band technique really well. Okay, and there it is right there, you know, growing. We put them, when we do this grass, you put them somewhere humid for a few days, for a, about a week, so that the wound heals really slowly and the two can connect up into each other and you get a connection being made, okay? If you ever graft a sticky mentonii, Keep it stuck on there because it tends to grow cells underneath there and push itself off. Okay? 
So we use the, and this is another one right here, Teflon tape. Okay? So you put them humid, somewhere humid for just a few days till they connect, and then you pull them out of the humidity chamber so they don't rot on you. And there they are growing on their own. Okay? And it's a great way of rescuing plants whose root systems rot out. Okay? We had this happen with uh, the Astechium hintonii, actually Astechium ritteri. I got one of those ones that were uh, from UC Berkeley that they, they uh, took in a confiscation, and I almost lost it on its own root system, and I grafted the last little bit that I had, and it's a beautiful specimen now, okay? Because I saved it, so this one was rotting out on me, this crested uh, Epithenatha micromeris. Frankenstein plant right there, okay? Thank you very much. <laughs>